for the people on the camera. Um, let me just go over what we did last time. And so if you didn't make it, because there, there was a little bit fewer people here last uh, Wednesday because of the holidays, uh, the video's up and whatnot. And uh, just remind, God, where am I at? Uh, remind you of the big picture that since test three, we're talking about small objects because uh, there's uh, cells, right? Cells are very small objects. The cells are essentially my physical chemistry world. They're soap bubbles. We've been talking about soap, soap bubbles. Nanotechnology involves small things. Well, so that's another reason to cover soap bubbles because they're small, the thermodynamics of small things, which has everything to do with the surface. And um, we want to think of the work. The work just comes, you can just basically put all this down to work, which is surface tension times change in area. We talked about how important it is that it's positive. Remember that this is the analog to minus PV uh, for two dimensions, um, but, but it's two dimensional for one. The other thing is that it's positive and not negative, not minus PVD, uh, PVD, but plus yada, yada, yada. And we talked about all the consequences of that. And the big picture is in terms of like, that's kind of, kind of my field, nanotechnology. A lot, of, a very um, naive, uh, ask some random person on the street what this is. They would say, oh, you build, you make tools, you make robots, but you make them really small. Yeah, and that works because you can imagine for medical issues, that's a really good thing to have tools that are non-invasive as much as possible. Super sharp little knives are actually a really good thing. So, you know, as opposed to a spoon, so. Uh, there's a lot of value to that, but it, it, there's a lot more to it than, than just shrinking things down and building those Intel type of giant devices that build. they're actually about the size of a, of a dump truck. I've actually been to the Intel facility before, and the, the machines that build chips, there's like a 50-step process, and every process is done by a machine that's about the size of a dump truck. That's, that's pretty fair. And of course, what it does is manipulate things almost on an atom by atom scale. And so to think that all of this is just being able to manipulate single atoms is unfortunately wrong, and this is why. And it's because as you get smaller, as you get to objects, pieces of the devices are on the order of a couple of thousand atoms. More and more percent of the atoms are on the surface, and this thing, which is normally negligible to you know, the gas in your car, the gas in the cylinder, the things we've been talking about, when 20%, say again, 1,000 atoms, 20% on the surface, this becomes overwhelming, and it might actually be more uh, than the PV, right? PV is like the internal, and this is the external. This can overtake, and as we covered last time, um, we talked about chemical potential, which is everything, we talked about spheres, and what we did was we looked at the chemical potential of the bulk minus the chemical potential of the surface. And again, I'm just reviewing. Uh, this is proportional to r to the three because that's volume. And then, of course, surfaces are proportional to r squared. What you get is behavior like this. As you create a small object, you get a rise and then a fall. And, um, and so the big picture is that while, yes, I would like to make small objects, this is something that now becomes important that, that it goes beyond just simply shrinking said object, whatever that object is, a medical diagnostic, a nanoparticle, whatever. Uh, this starts to show up and it changes things and it's almost universally a bad thing. So what I see here, and we were talking about uh, water droplets at the time, is that the surface energy uh, surface energy scales as R squared, and that dominates at small values. R cubed dominates R squared, but only above the number one, right? So larger objects, R cubed dominates, R squared doesn't. Um, and one's positive and negative because of this anyway. Uh, if I try to make an object, a nano object in this size, it will fall apart on its own. It, its pressure on its surface, it just wants to explode because the, it hates the surface. It wants to get rid of the surface. But most of the atoms are on the surface. That's the equivalent of saying it's going to shake itself to pieces. Uh, so you need to make an object yay big. And this means that there is a limit to how big we can make nanotechnological objects. 
we, you know, as I talked about this last time, we could build computers with nano wires that are single atoms in a row. Oh wait, no, can we? No, we can't. There has to be a certain size and you can't get below that or the materials are just simply unstable and they'll just shake themselves apart. So that's one of the bigger pictures. Um, we also, um, uh, don't want to review anymore actually. Um, uh, just also, uh, related to this, we also derived this equation, again, just for you folks who didn't make it on um, last Wednesday, uh, that we, we looked at a phase diagram. This looks like the kind of thing I might could use a numerical uh, calculator question on the exam. Um, uh, so we, the, we derived a, basically a phase diagram equation. Uh, it looks like a phase diagram equation for uh, what is it? That would be like the liquid solid line, but since this is a small object with a radius, instead of pressure versus temperature, I have pressure, uh, pressure versus okay, pressure versus temperature instead of pressure versus radius. And what this also shows is that it's kind of related to this guy here. It shows that when an object gets smaller, the pressure, uh, this would be a water droplet, so the, pre the partial pressure of water at the surface of the water drop, it actually gets higher and higher as the object gets smaller, and eventually that partial the, the pressure gets so big that it just automatically evaporates itself, and that's basically in line with, with this thing right here. And anyway, uh, just watch the idea to see the derivation, and again, this looks like good fodder for a calculator question. Um, and yeah, okay. So what I wanted to cover then from here on out is um, we were talking about water bubbles, soap bubbles, and those are kind of similar. I wanted to go in a different direction and explain a little bit more about surface tension and give a different picture of that. Uh, right now, again, with water, with um, bubbles, right? Bubbles, it's easy because it's like, a, soap bubbles, it's like a balloon. You know how balloons work. You know that the stretchy pushes in. You know that surface areas like to go down. We've explored, you know, explained all that. And, um, and and that's very easy to understand because you understand like the elastic nature of a balloon. But I've been mentioning about inorganic nanoparticles. Now, now what is the surface tension? What does that mean for that? So let me do, uh, I'm going to just make some drawings and um, explain why, how that works, which is important for inorganic objects which are becoming, uh, materials chemistry is huge, but we're not really teaching that enough. I talked about, a lot of you had Cabana, right, for inorganic. Right. He and I have talked about this because he is forced to teach all the, you know, the fundamentals, uh, coordination compounds, right, uh, organometallics, point groups, but we really need to cover more solid state chemistry because solid state chemistry is where we get catalysts. Catalysts are responsible to solid state catalysts. That's how the petrochem industry works. Even though I know they're described as evil, I think you like your car, I think you like the power, and they're responsible. So uh, they uh, transform a lot of the products they get from the ground with, uh, with inorganic materials. We think inorganic materials are how you make solar cells that we're going to replace the petrochem industry with. And it's just not dogmatically taught because we're still basing our education from about 1900. And this is all stuff that's really come around since about the 1980s. And uh, so anyway, now that I have some flex time, I do want to cover a little bit about how solid state materials work. And it comes to small particles and surface tension. And to do that, I'm going to draw, draw a crystal. Uh, so imagine like an Intel chip. And these are silicon atoms. I'll do the best I can to, eh, OCD kicking in. I'll do the best I can to. I, I, this is yeah, one of those kinds of PowerPoint. And so this, uh, I don't know what kind of crystal structure. I know I should be drawing hexagonal close pack, but not everything is hexagonal close pack. So I'm drawing this like, um, you know, kind of a cubic maybe. What is this, face center cubic or body center cubic? I don't quite remember. Um, I really should have looked that up before class, but I was busy forgetting my camera. Okay, so now, Again, imagine I've taken a piece of silicon and wrong crystal structure, but you get my point, and I'm cutting through it. And this is the surface and this is the bulk. And now also imagine that I'm doing, I'm making this, you two up there, you're really driving me nuts? Yeah. Um, imagine that you're building this uh, with like little magnetic 
uh, beads, like you know those toys they sell at airports. And uh, as such, what I want you to do is uh, imagine my OCD nature that if I had say uh, one, two, uh, four times three, eighteen. Imagine I have like fifty of these, and I'm I would build them into a, like a perfect cube. So if I could look at the top. Uh, it would be very flat and square, and uh, that's why I would call this a 100 surface. At a, this, these numbers, you, you may have seen these before in various forms, or I, I don't know what all of you read, but I see these a lot when I see any paper on uh, materials. Uh, this is called a Miller Index. And uh, did Cabana cover Miller Indices? Didn't get a chance, huh? It's what he's telling me. He's really just PO that he, he just doesn't have to cover all that stuff that's required for your MCATs. He, he doesn't get to this, and then I'm upset at that too. Um, what this is, is a very simple, I'm not going to cover it. If you look on Wikipedia, it, you'll figure it out in five minutes. But this basically is a way of understanding the natural shape of the surface. There's a bit more to it than that, but again, in my OCD nature, if I had a bunch of little magnetic beads and I built a perfect cube, uh, if this was the underlying crystal structure and I looked at the top, you know, if I turned this to the side, I would see a flat surface. That's a 100 surface. So anyway, that's, that's what this means is that the top is flat. And I'll contrast that to something else in a second. Okay, anyway. Okay, so this is all bulk. Okay, but this is the 100 surface. Where is surface tension? It works like this. Let's, let's, let's make this one special. And, um, and we'll, and this guy is inside. It doesn't really matter when, uh, where. Okay. What I want to do is count the number of atoms that are next to these guys. And it looks like Y has four right next to Ken Corner. That looks not overcomplicated. And X has one, two, and X is three, right? Right? One, two, three, four. What, is that right? Remember, I can't represent a three-dimensional object on a board. Try again. For Y, one, two, three, four, five, six, right, in and out, six. Okay, there's six, and X has five. Okay, right. Now, here's where being on a surface sucks. Five, this is an atom. It, 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 the inside has six because that's what it wants. You know, 18 rule and all this, you know, octet rule, 18 electron rule. Well, five, uh, X doesn't, five doesn't do it. And it's, it's PO to that. So what happens is these atoms next to it kind of squeeze it. Squeeze it to kind of give it a little electron density because it doesn't have enough. It, it, it needs it because there's supposed to be an atom up here and there's not. And so it forces those, this nearby atoms to kind of get a little bit closer. They hug each other a little bit tighter. Now notice that, who says that that's not X? So that's not X, right? So it, the problem gets compounded. All these things are just basically trying to squeeze together. Remember, surface area likes to shrink. Gases naturally expand, expand minus PV. Surfaces like to shrink, plus gamma D uh, surface area, right? And that, so that's why. Okay, now. That's all fine and good. You're seeing a little bit about how surfaces work. You're seeing a little bit about what inorganic surface tension means, surface energy. Um, now, let's make a nanoparticle, and a particle will be approximately spherical. Okay, to do that, I'm going to have to add more atoms. And, okay, so I may screw this up. Hopefully not too bad. There we go. And you can see I'm slowly... Uh, okay, what I've done here, now I'm building a new facet. And if I could, you know, build this for my magnetic spheres, and of course I would arrange it as perfectly as I could, because the OCD, and I then tilted it, it would be triangular. I, I hope that's not too hard to imagine, but yeah, this would be triangular. And let's play the same game, okay? Um, uh, why is still, well here, what do I want to do? I want to do this guy. Um, X and Y is still Y. Uh, I thought you would call it X prime. <coughs> so we don't get confused. And there's one, two, four. four, right? There's four, right? One, two, three, four. Okay, 
that sucks. That's much worse. It wants six bonds. It was bad enough when it had five, now it has four. And so this 100 surface is really blowing chunks. I mean, actually my drawing here isn't really all, see how screwed up it looks? I'm actually not really that far off in how I drew this. So this surface is even compressing itself even tighter, more and more. Uh, and so and so that's bad. Remember, that this is where the bad comes from. So uh, now imagine I drew a whole sphere out of this, and you can see how many atoms are on the surface, how many of them are lacking uh, bonding partners, and how much is trying to fix that by distortion. Well, it's going to distort itself to death. It's going to break itself in two. And actually, when I used to make small nanoparticles, if I, if I could make them um, and I would try to grow them, if I didn't do it just the right way, all of a sudden they would, it was like I'd make something that was like a nice red color, all of a sudden it would just disappear. And we were curious what the heck happened and we imaged them with electron microscope and we found that these inorganic particles had split in two. And that, that was why the color changed. So yeah, this is a very, very real effect and I just want to remind you, okay, to build a sphere then I have to, anyway, I'm not doing a great job with this, but just, just imagine that a nanoparticle, you can see how all these surfaces, uh, how you have different types of 100 and 111 surfaces. And um, so, so note that a sphere, sorry, this is kind of crude, as, as I'm doing it like this, for a very faceted sphere, you can see how it's composed of 100 and 111. And again, these are called Miller indices, they're just ways of tracking what a surface would look like if it's stacked a certain way. Now, here's, here's where everything gets worse. Now, this is a very crude looking sphere. If I made it more round, I would have to be bigger. Okay, that's fine. You can just kind of see that by how I stacked atoms. But if I'm going to make it more round, uh, more round, you're going to have to have, you know, faceting like this. See what I mean? You're going to, you're going to have to bend it. Uh, at a little bit sharper angles, and uh, here, why don't I just finish that, and then I'll do this one here. Uh, well, I screwed up, but anyway, um, as I make it more round, I'm going to have to have even steeper facets, and those will be like 221 and 222, blah, 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 not 222, anyway, uh, the more round I make this, the more I run into these problems, and the higher that energy is, the worse the problem gets. At the same time, uh, by making it bigger, it gains that internal energy that actually keeps it stable. So the whole point of this is that surfaces are bad. They cause things to fall apart much smaller than you think they would. Um, but, but everything, it's really kind of hard to, you know, how, it's hard to predict because like I just said, to make an object more round requires more faceting to the surface. As I've showed you, you faceted the surface more. That's bad, but I'm also gaining more bulk inside, and that's good. How do they balance? Go do the experiments and tell me, right? That, that's kind of where uh, we're at in terms of our just basic knowledge. And um, there is one, uh, one good thing about this, though, and that's why Catalyst uh, it's very naive, again, to say when, when I say to somebody, like, okay, so why do we make small catalysts? Surface area, of course, the surface area, you know, take a big chunk, break it up into smaller pieces, nano sized pieces. Yes, the surface area is bigger. Then you throw those inorganic, like those palladium particles, you throw them into the uh, reactor bed at the petrochem company and out come the right products. Hey, that's great. Uh, and yes, surface area is important. However, what happens is, is that reactions, you can imagine, um, I'll, I'll use A and B. Uh, a gets transformed to B at a heterogeneous surface, they tend to work better at these, at these types of sites because they're so high energy. When A like is interacting with this, say this is like a platinum or palladium particle, it actually will lower the barrier to turn into B because the surface energy is so high. That's a very good thing. So that's the one time that this all this surface energy nano stuff actually is helpful most of the time. Okay, last bit uh, about surface energy and inorganic particles. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, I mean, I, as, as I mentioned, I've been to Intel, and I actually kind of have a lot of roots in Intel. 
And so I know quite a bit about how their processes work. And maybe they'll hire them today. <laughs> Uh, you know that they do a lot of things by building one thing on top of another thing. Of course, they're inorganic or they wouldn't last very long. There's this whole movement towards, or you may hear of organic electronics. <coughs> Good luck. I mean, lots of, I don't want to, you know, denigrate the work of all the chemists that are doing organic electronics, but organics are just unstable oxidation happens and so what you do is when you build an in, uh, organic like an organic screen that are actually sold on some uh, camera phones um, what what you do is you put them in a device with all these really reactive chemicals with oxygen to make sure oxygen doesn't get to them but as soon as that gets spent oxygen gets oxygen will get into anything if you wait long enough no matter how well you seal something vacuum seal something Oxygen still gets in, no matter what. It's just a matter of time. And the organics oxidize. All organics are going to oxidize, and bam, the device is destroyed. That's why inorganic CPUs are much better. They just don't oxidize. Or they don't oxidize nearly as fast. OK, now the way Intel does this is they have substrates, often silicon oxide, and they're going to pattern the surface with your wires and your transistors and all the other jazz that make your CPUs. But you run into a problem. Notice I haven't drawn the whole thing. You run into a problem when you look at these crystal structures and these faceting. If this material doesn't fit, um, sorry, let me, let me start from above. If this is your substrate, and let's say, again, let's say it's SiO2. And below it, by the way, is a, um, is a silicon wafer. They intentionally oxidize the surface for lots of reasons, but for one, it's going to get oxidized no matter what. They just go ahead and let it happen. Okay, now they need to put down a material on top of it, and that will be like sprayed down from above. That material may not inherently have the same crystal structure as the host <coughs> below it. In other words, it doesn't fit. And so what happens is, while you may want to make this nice wafer, this nice flat wire or whatever, what you actually get is like a little island. And it often comes out triangular, and I think that's just, uh, I think it just happens to be that way. I don't think there's any fundamental reason. Uh-oh, there we go, sorry. Okay, so again, when you're trying to spray a material down on top of a substrate, again, this is where your CPUs come from, you can't just put down any, like say this is like an aluminum wire. I, I'm just making these up. I don't know what, really what they do. But uh, let's say this is like an aluminum wire. The atoms don't fit on the substrate. And what happens is they break up into small pieces. <coughs> you can't make your wire. It don't work. So uh, this is unfortunately true of just about everything. What they have to do to do the right engineering is do something, I heard that, called epitaxial. Um, old timey. Uh, when I was very young, they, they didn't, I'm old enough that we actually still had rotary phones. I was very young. And only when I was about five years old did we have the touch phones that your phone doesn't emulate. Okay, so what happens is, uh, if you can actually do this right, which is just a matter of getting the right material, if the underlying atomic structure of whatever, matches or closely matches well enough SiO2, you can get what's called, this is called epitaxial. Epitaxial growth uh, of the next thing on top. Uh, that being said, again, you, you can actually build one architecture on top of, on top of another. Uh, basically, it works. But for the most part, you can't just put anything on top of, of one substrate on top of another. You can't do that because the atoms don't match, and all that surface strain causes this to happen. Uh, instead, you have to get, you only have a limited cache of materials that you're going to get epitaxial growth, and then you can build what you want. But again, note that, the limita that there's actually fairly extreme limitations. Now, here's another thing. Uh, now, I'm going to put this on the test, but um, here's another cool thing you can do with this is um, people are actually making lasers this way. If you get a material that's semi-epitaxial, so it matches but not super well, uh, what happens is that you get epitaxial growth at low levels.
because the strain, strain's extensive, right? The more atoms that are displaced, the, the more push. So what happens is if you build this bigger, if you build this bigger, the, that strain from all the surfaces not matching up gets really great, and then you get a fissure. You get a crack. And I hope, hopefully that's coming out okay. Anyway, the material on top cracks into pieces. And that sounds bad, but actually people figured out a way to make lasers out of this. And I, I can't, I, I wish I had another half an hour to explain how that part works. But um, anyway, this is just another level of materials engineering that sometimes you actually want to create, sometimes you actually want to create little islands um, on top of a material, and this is just one way to do that. It's called strain-driven um, strain nanomaterial growth, something like that anyway. It's actually kind of a complicated name, but again, a lot of things are built this way. Okay, last bit is how do you, uh, how do you deal with any of this uh, in terms of like my own world of nanotechnology? Uh, let, let me get back to, yeah, let me get back to this picture here of atoms on the surface. And here, I'll draw a couple more. So um, if I'm making my nanoparticles, how do I, how do I make this, how do I make this not fall apart? Uh, because this is really a major problem, so I'm just trying to draw some surface atoms here. Uh, what you do is, and actually I've made lasers out of these. Actually, I never told a class this. I actually invented the world's smallest laser when I was at MIT. <laughs> Stop raising. <laughs> it's not really that special. <laughs> I actually did, yes, I actually invented the world's smallest laser and I made it out of nanoparticles. Um, that's kind of a, um, it's kind of like saying, it is true, it's true, I have a patent on it. I, I get a couple thousand dollars every year for that. It's actually, you know, it's not in any devices, it's totally impractical. I don't even know why anyone bought the patent. But uh, <laughs> just, just, actually I'll explain this in 344. It's kind of like saying, while well, this is a record, it's like I ran the fastest 100 meter at this stadium. It's not like saying I ran the fastest 100 meter ever, that's what I'm saying both. Instead, it's like I ran the fastest 100 meter at the stadium to say that I invented the world's smallest laser. That's because it depends on the wavelength. If you have a microwave laser, then the laser has to be about this big. I invented a green laser, it has to be about 500 nanometers, which it was. So it depends on the wavelength of light. So no one can really claim what I just said, so it was a little bit of a farce. No one can claim they invented the world's smallest laser because to beat my record, which someone has, they have to just use a different wavelength and then they can. But again, it's about as meaningful as saying I ran the fastest 100 meter, but only at this you know, track. Um, so, and how did I do it? Is I used these particles and I coated them inside of, the, of a very small laser cavity and, um, and then I just used a very advanced microscope to, to prove that it was actually a laser. Anyway, details aside. Um, but notice that I ran into the same problem. And as I mentioned, that when I was making these things, I would often see them split in two and get destroyed because they were too small. Uh, so how did I beat that problem? I beat it with using surfactants. And uh, so the way that this works is, now remembering that our little X guy is missing a bond, what I do is, I add something else, and so I'm drawing this smaller for a reason. I add a surfactant, and I'll give that a little plus sign. And this is a surfactant. Soap. I did it with soap. And I think as I mentioned to you when I got into after test three on a Monday last week, that a lot of nanotechnology, about half of it uses soap. The half that isn't like Intel chip making, the half that's actually like nanotechnology in a, in a uh, round bottom flask, we're all soap chemists, every one of them. There's a huge number of people what I, that do what I do. We all, I actually synthesize my own soap. That's, I'm actually considered one of the better people at this because I know how to synthesize soap. I actually have videos on YouTube showing how to synthesize soap, specifically phosphoric acids. Okay, so what happens is when I'm making this, because I add soap to the particles, they kind of gain that bond back, kind of. It's not perfect because if this is, say, selenium, I, I make my particles out of selenium, uh, it wants a, a, a metal like zinc. Uh, so selenium would like to pair to zinc. 
this isn't zinc, it's actually phosphorus. Anyway, my point being is that it doesn't quite get what it wants, but it's better than nothing. Here's the next thing about this. You know, well, okay, I've treated one surface. You, you notice that, okay, this is no longer the surface. That's basically what I did. This isn't the surface, but now I have a new one. So maybe that part will be the, uh, where mechanical failure occurs. Well, no, it won't, and here's why. Uh, going back to our, let's say that this is like a bubble of water. Let's turn this into a real bubble, bubble because these are the numbers I've got. Look at the surface tension of H2O. This is 0 0.072 newtons per meter. And if this was like oil, right, because you know soap, soap is oily, uh, oil, the surface tension is 0 0.021 newtons per meter. Okay, and now remember that, uh, okay, I solved the problem of X not having, of X not having enough bonding, missing some bonds. I did solve that problem, that's a big problem. So I introduced a new surface, but here's the thing, that new surface is oily, and it looks like it has one, you know, one third, one fourth the surface tension. Now, if you want to think of this material as unstable due to pressure, like I said before, when you get a small droplet small enough, the pressure gets very, very high. Well, that's because, um, well, in this case, the reason this is alleviated by that equation I drew up there, that pressure at the surface is proportional to E to the surface tension. So if I drop surface tension by giving it an oily coating, it's actually huge in terms of stabilizing the particle. And thermodynamics shows us why. So um, that's actually all I had to say about this stuff, but I do want to just, I want to show you one more thing. Uh, and next time we're going to talk about protein structure. Uh, now that I'm talking about soap, I see some of you. Now we're talking about soap. Uh, before I get into proteins, I want to just introduce a lot of people outside. I want to introduce hydrophobicity uh, because hydrophobicity has a lot to do with uh, how proteins arrange themselves in solution. And um, so next time again, I'm going to talk all about the thermodynamics. I'm going to mostly focus on protein folding because that's something I'm actually pretty familiar with. And yeah, I've got uh, three or four minutes. Okay, so when it comes to hydrophobic, uh, so hydrophobic particles and what's the reason this is relevant to proteins dissolving in water is that protein structure, which is really important, is thought to result from minimizing hydrophobic interactions within the protein and maximizing the hydrophilic outside the protein because we think of proteins as always in water. And so let me tell you a little bit about hydrophobic things, how they dissolve in water. Now, they don't, right? That's where the word comes from. But let's, let's get into a little bit of detail why. And this is one of the neatest things I know that really, really shocks me. And I, I, I double take, I actually have to read Wikipedia Again, every year that I cover this to make sure that this is right. Okay, so we've covered this guy. I've actually alluded to this a little bit. The problem with the dissolving here, I'm just going to represent, this is a hydrophobic particle, and this is water. Okay, so there's the oxygen and hydrogen, so it would be a little bad, okay? Okay, now here's the damnedest thing. Um, let, let me draw what has to happen to the water. Yeah, this is kind of cartoonish and maybe a little bit over, overblown, but it kind of gets the idea across. Um, I had to practice this a little bit before class and I didn't, so I'm kind of screwing this up. Uh, there we go, now I got it right. There's a little pattern to this. Okay, the water is gonna surround the hydrophobic particle in such a way that, what do you think? Delta X is positive or negative? Okay, so this is the water surrounding the particle. Here's the water on the outside. I'm just gonna draw up or down or side left and right. What do you think? Delta X is positive or negative? Negative. It's negative. Right, now remember I actually told you this a while ago, but it's been a while. It turns out that when you introduce something in water that water doesn't like, it's actually going to order itself around it. It, it just it doesn't fit otherwise. 
And so you're actually going to lose entropy. Remember that's bad, right? Negative, negative, positive, positive is bad. Remember when it comes to energy, positive is bad. Okay, now you can imagine that this is going to change, right? This is a very non-ideal solution. There's going to be an enthalpy. And I can tell you that breaking up hydrogen bonds, right, remember water. Water is all about hydrogen bonds. Um, and if you break them up, you're going you're gonna to have to absorb some energy. That would be positive. Right, so again, breaking up hydrogen bonds is going to require an input of energy. That would be a positive delta H. Okay, what do you think the delta H is, positive or negative? Do the hydrogen bonds break up or not? Huh? Positive or negative? Negative. Negative. This is the damnedest thing. H bonding is enhanced. Trust me, I told you I have to check Wikipedia every time before this class. Hydrogen bonding is actually enhanced by the hydrophobic particle, and I think that's because of the way it orders itself better when something it doesn't like actually plops itself in. And that means that heat is released. No, wait, I, no, 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 wait, 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 did I do that wrong? Um, it enhances H bonding, so no, no, it's negative, it's negative. Uh, no, 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 wait, no, no, I got that wrong. That was positive, my bad. My, that's bad. Um, it released. No, 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 it's negative, negative, negative. My bad, my bad. No, it's negative. My notes say negative. I just convinced myself otherwise. Okay, yeah, so hydrogen bonding is enhanced, and basically when you form a bond, it releases energy, right? So, and that, that you would form, that would feel as hot. Sorry about my, you know, I, this isn't the material I'm best at, obviously, but again, the material gets ordered around the particle, the hydrogen bond more, the formation of bonds releases energy, I'm holding it, and it's getting hot. So double negative. Now what's bad about this is that I've got negative positive. And in the case of something that's oily, right, oil, obviously this guy wins because delta G is positive. Oil doesn't dissolve in water, but it does have this guy helping it. Oddly enough, Enthalpy helps it. Entropy of the outside increases, and that's helpful. But it's not enough to account for the entropy of mixing for an oil droplet. Now, take a, take a protein, which has hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues. What do you think? Help or hurt? It's still negative, and it's actually negative just enough to overwhelm this part. And that's why proteins actually dissolve. That's what I'm going to cover next time, but this is why protein structure is very difficult. Because protein structure is a double negative, and they barely balance each other out for proteins to dissolve and fold correctly. Okay, come pick up